I'm Polly Patullo, publisher of Papillot Press, and I'm here in Dominica, often described as the nature island of the Caribbean. Welcome to this edition of En Papillot. Here is The Art of White Roses by Viviana Prado Nunez. It's an award-winning young adult novel. I wanted to publish it because not only is it beautifully, powerfully and poignantly written, but also because it explores what happens when political violence invades an ordinary family on an ordinary street, in this case, in suburban Havana. I'll let Viviana tell you more, and she will also read an extract from The Art of White Roses. I hope you enjoy the reading. Hi, everybody. My name is Viviana Prado Nunez, and I'm a Puerto Rican, a Cuban author, poet, playwright, theater artist, etc. Um, and today I'm going to be reading from my novel, The Art of White Roses. Um, it's a book set in 1950s Cuba during the Cuban Revolution, and it follows the perspective of a young 13 year old girl as people in her street are going missing and her father is having an affair and a lot of stuff happens. So I urge you to read it. Um, I'm going to be reading from Chapter six, con la mano izquierda. Let's go. All right. As we drove into Havana, I gazed out the windows at the chaos of it all. What I loved about it most were the people. There were old ladies smoking cigars on the sidewalk and girls with their skirts cinched who giggled at the young men. In the streets, the old men peered over the balconies at the boys pinguinos age who played baseball with their shirts off. And the buildings, of course. I'd never been to Spain, but that must have been what it was like. The cathedrals, the castles, and Malecón by the sea. In the older part of the city where Papi worked, the buildings were crumbly and beautiful. Some had huge red domes and others were colonial houses with large glinting windows. The streets were lined with rugged cobblestone and dirt specked buildings that popped with color every few blocks. Tangerine, bright turquoise, pink, lizard green. Alleyways turn into staircases with shops on the side, their signs hanging over the streets in midair. In the newer part, the buildings were different. They were white and tall, like pillars of salt in the sun. The streets were filled with people and fancy cars and cyclists with fresh produce in their baskets and vendors at the stoplights who sold guavas, guapeng, mangoes, platanos, flowers, and miniature Cuban flags. The tanks were leaving the city as we drove in, and we had to stop at an intersection as one of them rolled by, huge and green, the cannon sticking out like an eye stalk. Binguino had never seen a tank before, and he was fascinated, staring with his mouth agape, nudging me and saying, it's so big, Adela. When the tank passed, we drove on. I was leery about being in the car with Papi. The last time he'd driven us to the shoe shop after school, he kept bothering Pinguino about the nine-year-old girl in his class named Lucia and saying that he'd seen Pinguino making goo-goo eyes at her at church and that he had asked mommy to organize the wedding already. Pinguino kept hitting him on the shoulder every time he said something stupid, but Pinguino laughed anyway because Papi could make things funny even when they weren't. Until we stopped at an intersection and there was a girl with a short skirt and high heels walking at the curb. It was obvious she was a prostitute. You saw them more in the alleyways and groups, but rarely alone. She was thin, but her shirt was up to her navel and her skin hung out a bit at the back. Then the light turned green and Papi and Pinguino were laughing about girls and Papi said, hey, look at this one. He rolled down the window and yelled puta as he drove around the corner. It was only a split second, but I would never forget the look on the girl's face as she spun around to see who had called her a whore. It was the same as Maria Viramontes when Sister Tula struck her in front of the classroom. In the end, she was a girl, just like me and Lucia and poor Maria Viramontes. 
I knew she was a prostitute, but I couldn't help feeling sorry for her anyway. For a while afterwards, it was hard seeing Bobby, the same man who had taught me to ride a bike and to write my name in cursive without seeing the girl's face and the slight O of her mouth and the question in her eyes as he raced away from her roaring with laughter.